Good morning, Cornerstone Church Colchester. It's great that you can join us for another week of our online services. Uh, maybe it's your first time tuning in, in which case you are particularly welcome. Well, I'm not quite sure how, but we've reached December, the last month in a year that is certainly going to go down in history books. It's been a year like no other in living memory. But one of the things I've really noticed and appreciated is how keen the nation is to celebrate Christmas. Despite all the rubbish that this year has brought, Christmas is still going to be celebrated by something like 25 million households in the UK as an important part of our national heritage and our calendar year. But I've often wondered how many of these households understand the reason behind why we all get these two bank holidays and we all throw a big old party. Christmas is so much more than eat, drink and be merry, right? Well, we really hope that this year, given the kind of year we've had, there might be some who are a bit more reflective and are questioning what this life is all about. And in turn, they may find the true joy of celebrating Christmas, the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this time of Advent, which we're now in, is a time to prepare for Christmas. Yeah, sure. The Christmas shopping, food buying, deciding who'll be in your Christmas bubble. But more importantly, preparing ourselves to hear and celebrate the true reason for the season. So with that in mind, let's come before God in prayer now. As we say this prayer for the second Sunday in Advent, uh, followed by the prayer that Jesus taught his followers to say. Blessed Lord who caused the Holy Scriptures to be written for our learning, grant that we may so hear, read, mark, learn and inwardly digest them, that through patience and the comfort of your Holy Word, we may embrace and forever hold fast the joyful hope of everlasting life which you have given us in our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. This term in our children's slots, we're answering the question, what is church? And today we're finding out that church is a bride. In the Bible it says this, So a man will leave his father and mother and will be united to his wife, and the two people will become one body. That secret truth is very important. I am talking about Christ and the church. Well, this part of the Bible is telling us about marriage, but it says that while marriage is about a man and a woman, it's also about Jesus and the church. In fact, the reason God gave us marriage is so that we would understand something important about the church and Jesus. So there are two parts to this marriage. Hopefully it's not hard to work out which is which. So here we are. Here is our groom. He's the husband. This is Jesus. Jesus is like the groom. Now the thing about the groom is he gives everything to love his wife. He thinks about what's best for his wife, not what's best for himself. And that's how he decides to love his wife. You know what Jesus did for the church to show that he loved us. You can think about that for a moment. Well, this passage says that the bride, or the wife, is like the church. This is much harder to understand. Whether you're a girl or a boy, whether you're a man or a woman, whether you're married or not, you are part of the church, which is like a wife. 
So here we are. We're all in here. All of us together are like one wife. You know what Jesus did for his church to show us that he loved us. He chose to die, not because he wanted to, not because it was easy, not because he thought this will be fun. He did it because it was exactly what the church needed. We needed Jesus to die for us. So that's how he chose to love us. The church has the best husband ever. Because we are Jesus's bride, we will do what the Bible tells all wives to do. We will listen to our husband because we know that he would do anything for us. When Jesus tells us what is best for us, we will remember that he gave up his life for us so we can think, okay, that must be right. We are like a bride. We are perfectly loved and we have the perfect husband helping us to understand the best way to live as a church. If you're married, your marriage can help your children and the rest of the world understand more about Jesus and the church. We can look at a good marriage and say, that helps me understand how Jesus loved the church and how the church loves Jesus. Well, why don't I pray that we would do this? Let's pray together. Dear Father, we thank you that Jesus is like the perfect husband. Thank you that he never did what was best for himself, but he only did what was best for his wife, the church. Thank you that as a church, we are like a bride, spotlessly clean, forgiven of all sin, made perfect, ready for heaven. Please help us to be a church that listens to Jesus and trusts him when he tells us how to live. Amen. Well, we're now going to sing a song which encourages us to listen to Jesus, to trust him and to follow him. I hope you enjoy singing and I definitely hope you enjoy the actions.
Well, your activity this week is to make a bride. And if you've got time, make a groom too. You might have some wooden spoons lying about like me, but you might just want to use something else. Whatever you've got lying around, see if you can make a bride. I would suggest that tissues are really helpful for making the dress. Whatever you come up with, have lots of fun and remember that we are the bride and Jesus is our perfect husband. The Bible reading today is from John chapter 1, verses 1 to 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Your word is good. It's ever faithful. Worth more than gold, the heart's delight. Your word gives life to all who hear and obey. Your word endures forever. Your word is true, it never changes. It formed the earth, sustains it still. Your word defends, providing refuge and strength. Your word endures forever. Your word is a lamp unto my feet. Your word is a light unto my path. Truth and the way and the story.
thank you so much uh, for joining us at Cornerstone Church Colchester. Uh, my hope is that these three sermons in John chapter 1 will really help us prepare to celebrate that most momentous time when God in the person of his son Jesus Christ became human not just for a little bit but forever and so we are on holy ground as we consider these things but I'm preaching these sermons in in little chunks of about five six minutes each um, hopefully so we can divide them up and then and then send them to friends and family those sections that we feel might be helpful well let me just pray as we start father we thank you and praise you for your word the lord jesus christ through whom you made all things through whom you sustain all things through whom you are speaking to us even this morning so father we pray that you'd speak and show us the lord jesus christ in whose name we pray amen well are you living in the real world well, in one sense, we all are, aren't we? But what I mean by that is, can you see the real world? See, most people in our culture claim that there is no creator. When they look at the world, they see no creator. And so, largely because of the people who have influenced them, they think Adam and Eve is, is a fairy story, a sort of Bronze Age myth. Evolution, they claim, is evidence that there is no creator, as if by explaining something we could explain ultimate causation away. But that's what people believe. We are told that we live in a universe of blind physical forces. We're free to do what we want, to live how we want, to decide what our morality is to be. This is the dominant view. We're told that this is the real world and it is isn't it well there'll be a slide coming up on your screens uh, to show that this has not been the dominant view for very long e even if people now call themselves atheists and the majority of people in the most recent survey identify as those of no religion most of us now live or assume practical atheism I mean, the recent pandemic has shown this, hasn't it? Who has suggested in political life of praying for the situation? We don't do God since the early 2000s. Practical atheism is our default position and it seeps in through the TV we watch, the books we read, the public discourse. I mean, imagine a politician was to say, well, let's pray about that. That would be the death knell of their career, wouldn't it? The end of being taken seriously. Now, it's only 70 years since George VI called for, and the Prime Minister, considered to be, to be our greatest ever Prime Minister, Winston Churchill, approved a National Day of Prayer. You can see the picture of the queues outside Westminster Abbey of people praying for the nation. Yet, in our films, the prayer that led to a flat calm for the rescue of the British army at Dunkirk is not even included as history, even though it really happened. Or the King's Speech, I'm sure we've all watched the film, The King's Speech. Did you know that he was a Christian? No, you see, even our history is being rewritten to glorify not God, the creator, but man. So when we come to considering God as creator, and, and that's at the heart of what it means to celebrate Christmas, we're up against two challenges, whether we're just investigating the Christian faith or whether we've been Christian for some years. You see, the first challenge is this. We're told that science is atheistic, that it's evidence for atheism, even though science is actually an essentially Christian activity. It, it can't be used against Christianity. It's part of the world view of Christianity. And, and so if it is used against Christianity, well, people are lying about science. I don't mean that all scientists are Christians, rather that science rose from a Christian worldview and coheres with it. It didn't rise from an atheistic worldview or an Islamic worldview or any other worldview. No, it arose from a Christian worldview and scholarship has clearly demonstrated this. Uh, not just 
by chance, but because of a Christian worldview, specifically the belief in the fall of Adam and Eve and the belief in the incarnation, the belief in Christmas. So that's the first reason why people don't really consider God as creator. But the second is that people don't really understand that the Bible's account of creation is, is far more complex and deep than just God made everything out of nothing a long time ago and it was perfect. The Bible has so much more to say. Yes, God made all things in the beginning and they were very good, but not perfect. We don't live in a perfect world created by God. So let's consider those two obstacles to believing in the reality of a creator. Well, here's a slide that begins our next five minute section. I wonder if you know who said this? I think that when you consider the beauty of the world and you wonder how it came to be, what it is, you are naturally overwhelmed with a feeling of awe, a feeling of admiration, and you almost feel a, a desire to worship something. I feel this. I recognize that other scientists such as Carl Sagan feel this, Einstein felt it. We all of us share a kind of religious reverence for the beauties of the universe, for the complexity of life, for the sheer magnitude of the cosmos, the clear magnitude of geological time. And it's tempting to translate that feeling of awe and worship into a desire to worship a particular thing, a particular person. Well, those of you who know me well know that uh, it's uh, a quote from Richard Dawkins in one of his debates with uh, John Lennox, the professor of mathematics at Oxford University and mathematics and philosophy. See, if Dawkins, uh, the most convinced atheist there could possibly be, feels this desire to worship, feels awe when he observes the natural world, why does he think it's an illusion? Why doesn't he think that that is a real experience? Well, I would say because he doesn't understand science. Because he thinks that science explains away that kind of experience. Erwin Schrödinger put it like this. Science is very usually branded as being atheistic. You know, if we want to be strict about science, then we've got to be atheists. Well, after what we have said, this is not astonishing. If its world picture does not contain beauty and delight, sorrow, if personality is cut out of it by agreement, how should it contain the most sublime idea that presents itself to the human mind? And he was talking about the idea of God. So what Schrodinger is saying is if you really understand science, you will know that science gets rid of God and beauty and meaning and morality and personality before it starts. So how can it possibly be evidence that those things don't exist? You see, if you cut these things out by agreement in scientific method, uh, you're not explaining them away by science. Yes, science can give par powerful answers, but not the whole answer. Science, an atheist would claim, shows that nature is only a wildebeest being eaten by crocodiles, or a deer fawn being chased down by a wolf pack, and, and a cuckoo calling in spring might be beautiful, that might be our experience, but that is to be overwhelmed by our knowledge that a cuckoo is a, a parasitic bird, laying its eggs in the nest of other birds, and the chick then murdering basically all the other chicks. But why should one overwhelm the other? So what an atheist will say was, get, get real Christian. Okay, you want to believe in fairy tales of creation. The nature is beautiful and harmonious, fine, but keep it to yourself and keep it private. Don't expect us to run society based on the illusion of love and selflessness. Being human is not about love or self-sacrifice, but survival like the rest of the animal kingdom. That's what science tells us. Well, that's not the real world. You see, the real world is both. The real world is not an exclusion of beauty and God and morality and love because we know that evolution is full of 
ruthlessness. Now, we, we know that it's both. It's a half-truth to pit science against the arts. It's a half-truth to pit cruelty against morality or ruthlessness against love. And it's a dangerous half-truth because it dehumanises people. And we've seen this in the pandemic, haven't we? The dehumanisation that's been going on. See, if you put atheism into an algorithm, just science, then the algorithm you get out that determines our, our policy is atheistic and inhuman. See, what if love and expressing love is real? What if people just following the science are reduced emotionally, morally, psychologically, prohibited from loving? You know, we know that babies die if they're not loved from tragic circumstances in Romania. But why don't we consider that the human need for love and to show love is part of what distinguishes us from the animals. It's a basic human need. If we just follow the science, we end up being inhuman. And the government are following the science, they tell us, but some of the scientists are saying that those who really understand the limits of science never just follow the science. There's been a helpful um, panorama, I think, programme on, on the BBC, so do look that up. It's a much bigger problem. Economics, the humanity of a husband being able to say farewell to his dying wife, or a woman, the mother she loves in a care home. So we just follow the science. It dehumanises. Atheism has always, historically, dehumanised people. But this is where our culture is heading. Dehumanised culture, our education system increasingly treats human beings as grades on the great competition of life, not growing people. With Our health service is increasingly measured by biological outcome and cost, not necessarily care. Professionalism is not about trust, but by league tables. Now, I'm not saying that these things are worthless. They're part of the real world but they're not the whole picture. We should have learned from history that reducing human beings to complex animals that can be measured by science alone is dangerous. See, it's not the whole picture, and we know it's not the whole picture. Science never gives us the whole picture, though the materialists would love us to believe that. And like most half-truths, it is a dangerous lie that makes people believe they're animals, treat other people as animals and think that when they die, they rot. See, Dawkins' admission of feelings, of worship, well, could it be that they're real? Could it be that nature speaks, after all, not just of cruelty and suffering, but beauty and contentment, flies dancing in the light of a summer's evening, a, a kingfisher's brilliant blue darting along a river, moonlight painting the dew at midnight? Beauty that points to a beautiful one. Beauty that points to an artist of stunning power. So if we think that science supports atheism, we're not living in the real world. Well, now on to a, a next chunk. Well, why else do we find it difficult to believe in a creator? Well, because the Bible has been twisted to say something it really doesn't say. See, what I'm going to teach now is, I believe, orthodox biblical doctrine. It fits with what Christians have believed for thousands of years, but it's also new. And this is the first time I've preached it. I've tried to articulate it many times before. I call it creation ex hudatos, creation out of water. Now, we may be familiar with the phrase creation ex nihilo, creation from nothing. That phrase doesn't actually appear in the Bible, although the closest we can get is in, in Hebrews chapter 11, where the Apostles speaks of God creating things that are visible about of, out of things that are invisible. But creation ex hudatos as a phrase is an apostolic one, and we find it in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 says this, for they deliberately overlooked this fact, that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water, that's it, ex hudatos, out of water, and through water, by the word of God, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water, 
and perished. See, in Genesis chapter 1, before anything was formed, the Spirit of God hovered over the deep or over the abyss or over the waters, and the earth was without form. God had created the heavens and the earth, but then there were these waters. And God created out of these waters by speaking, let there be light. And there was light. So it was out of these waters that the word of God created all things. And it was in history, the Apostle Peter says, in the passage we've just had read, that these waters destroyed the world of that time. And then Peter adds, and by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist, so he's now talking about the first century, are stored up for fire, being kept until the destruction of the ungodly. So this world was created by the word out of water, by which that word also destroyed the world of that time, and by the same word will destroy the world at the end of time. See, creation and destruction are not unrelated in the Bible. See, what was created came out of water, ex hudotos, out of the thing that was then used to destroy the same world. Now, time does not enable me to show how this is the dominant view of creation in the Old Testament. Uh, I'll, I'll just go through some metaphors that we might find familiar if we're Christians with this way of thinking in the Bible. We are the clay. God is the potter in both creation and salvation. He takes something and forms it. God clothes the flowers of the field. God provides prey for the lions in Psalm 104. The sea cannot cross the boundaries that he sets. The sparrow dies, but not without the will of God. Human history, and so also natural history, looks chaotic, random even. We throw the dice, maybe even the dice of quantum physics, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Yes, there is the fall, the historical fall of Adam and Eve. Nature is shot through with groaning and frustration. But God is sovereign in his intend, superintendence of nature by a power so vast that it looks as if ugliness produces beauty, that ruthlessness produces care, that blind forces produce personality. But we know that this is not possible without something remarkable going on, his sovereign, loving power. And so the Psalms speak of his hands of love being seen everywhere, that he's loving towards all he has made. Yes, lions and sparrows and the sea and the moon and the stars. It's not miraculous, but there is something mysterious that speaks of a loving mind because of the very combination of ruthlessness and love, of blind forces and personality. It screams, it screams that God is sovereignly superintending nature to reveal his love. See, could it be that reality is both beauty and harmony and goodness and contentment and chaos, cruelty and randomness. Not because one is caused by the other, but because of the sovereign word of God, who is a person who created all things for him and by him and one day will destroy all things. Could it be that creation is Christ-shaped, cross shaped, not for a moment denying the historicity of the fall or the incarnation, but rather that all things were made by Christ and for Christ, as we'll now see is clear from our Bible passages. Now, why have I spent so much time doing that? Well, because we live in an age where the, the reality of a creator is doubted to such a degree that we need to clear away the rubble before we can even engage with the Bible's clear teaching that all things were made by Jesus Christ and for Jesus Christ. So let's now turn to our reading. The first thing we learn is that the Word is the Creator. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning 
with God. You see, John begins his gospel with the most shocking claim. And he wisely, I think, expresses it in a somewhat ambiguous way. He echoes that first line of the Old Testament. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In other words, God created everything in the beginning. There was a beginning and God was the cause of the beginning. And now he says, in the beginning was the word. God spoke. He's separate from his creation, but he brings it into being. And he says that in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with, was in the beginning with God. In other words, God is more than one. He is one. But this being the word who spoke the universe into existence was with God and was God and is God. Now, of course, for centuries, people thought that there was no beginning and philosophy frowned on there being a beginning. Philosophy taught that the universe was eternal. And then when the scientists observed that there was a background radiation, that the galaxies were all moving away from each other and the universe was expanding, run the clock back. This universe had a beginning. And people say, well, what do you think of the Big Bang? Without realising that this is support for the Christian worldview of there being a beginning. The Bible has been clear that there's been a beginning and science has only recently in the last century caught up. Of course, no one would want to admit that. See, we're trying to find out about the multiverse and, and claim that there is no such thing as history because he, every history exists, which is really to say that the universe is infinite, uh, which is a mathematical impossibility, apparently. But, but back to this idea, we, we don't like the idea of there being a creator. That's why we don't believe in a creator. It's not because there isn't one. So we don't want to live in the real world where there is a creator. You see, back to this idea of the natural world being both cruel and ruthless and full of beauty and harmony, how could they coexist? Well, only if there is the sovereign rule of a personal God. All things were made through him, John continues, and without him was not anything made that was made. See, John is clear that God is personal. God is not just a distant transcendent spirit, though he is that. He is also an imminent, throughout creation, present relational being. God the Father made the world through the Son, and so here John says, all things were made through him. That's through Jesus, the word. And without him was not anything made that was made. Now, is this just words on the page? Or is this God revealing reality to us? How would we know that this is reality? Well, as I've been trying to argue, reality is Christ shaped. Goodness and love coming out of cruelty and ruthlessness. Exactly what we see at the cross. The most loving event in human history when Jesus died on the cross to reconcile the universe to God, to reconcile people like you and me to him if we trust in him. That the place of divine love is also the place of the most horrific cruelty. Maybe creation was made by the one who would hang on a cross. So the word is the creator, but also the word is life and light. Uh, and this is another little, little nugget that I hope, you know, might be helpful for people, particularly for those who are just investigating the Christian faith. See, God has not left himself without witness in his universe, in our experience of his universe. And John says here in verse four, in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Or we might say in better translation, mastered it. The darkness has not mastered it. See, Jesus is the person who sustains the universe, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He upholds the universe for, by the word of his power. We're talking about the present now, not just the dim and distant past. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, present tense, and the darkness has not overcome it. The creator shines in the darkness. Bertrand Russell famously said, not enough evidence when he talked about Christianity. But what if our friend Bertrand was wanting everything to be light? 
What's, what if that's the evidence he was looking for? Rather than just enough evidence to dispel the darkness. See, what if we're given by God is light in darkness, life in death, love in cruelty, beauty in ugliness? What if that's reality? To say that we need everything to be beauty and everything to be life with no death and no ugliness, well, it's not reality. It's demanding something which is unreal. We can't say that because there's loads and loads of darkness, there is no light. Because there's loads and loads of death, there is no life. Because there's loads and loads of ugliness, there is no beauty. If it only takes a little light to know that darkness is not the only thing there is, if it only takes a little bit of beauty to know that ugliness is not the only thing there is, a little bit of love to know that there is not only ruthlessness and cruelty in this universe, and if we see that throughout creation, we're without excuse. We can't plead ignorance. See, if what if God the Word made everything, sustains everything, and is continually bringing life and light into this dark world that we all experience? Well, then we have no excuse if we reject him. Paul says as much in Romans chapter 1, the wrath of God is being revealed against all the godlessness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So that we're without excuse. If we see anything in reality, what do we see? We see God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature bringing beauty out of ugliness, bringing harmony out of chaos. And all this because creation is Christ-shaped, even cross-shaped. For by him all things were created, it says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. Whoever we are listening to this, the Bible's clear that you and I exist for Jesus Christ. To think we just exist for ourselves, that the universe revolves around us, is not to, re to live in the real world. It's utter nonsense, it's blindness, it's deafness, it's deadness. We know we are not the centre of the universe. It's to willfully put a blindfold on, to, to shove our fingers in our ears, to scream in the loudest way we can, shutting out of the, the light of what everyone can see in the darkness. And if we can see this, if we can see reality, we are to stop living for ourselves as if we are God. We are to stop believing those who are lying to us about science as if somehow science could disprove what it already assumes doesn't exist, or is somehow not part of a Christian worldview. If we live as if we're at the centre of the universe, we are making a terrible, terrible mistake. We're not living in the real world, because the real world is created by God, and the Creator has come into the world. He shines his light in the darkness. He commands everyone, everywhere, to stop living for themselves because by the same word with which he created the universe he's going to judge the world and this word this creator this one who is perceived throughout the whole of the universe will judge us see it's important that we live in reality and reality is a created world a world in which the Creator has come into his world, as we'll think about in a couple of weeks' time, in the person of his Son, Jesus Christ. And so for those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Word of God, the Creator, who worship him, we're not believing something which is a primitive fairy tale. We're living in the real world. Well, let's just pray. Father, we thank you and praise you that the fact that you created the world through the word, through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, that you created all things by him and for him 
is evident for all to see. Lord, we thank you that he has, from creation's first dawning, shone the light of his life in the things that are created throughout the whole history of this universe. Lord, we thank you that that light is our life. Even by being alive, we know that we have been created. And Lord, we're sorry. We're sorry for living as if we are the centre of the universe. We are the creators rather than the created who've been made for Jesus Christ. We're sorry, Lord, and we pray that you would help us to leave the darkness and to come into his light. And for those of us who are in his light, shine the light of his life into our hearts more deeply and fully, that we would know with greater confidence day by day that to live for Jesus Christ is to live in the real world. Amen. Well, you may be wondering why we're about to say something called the Chalcedonian Creed. In the early centuries of the Christian church, um, it was very difficult for the church to get together because um, many Christians were still persecuted uh, in the Roman Empire uh, in the first three centuries. Uh, but when it became the f official religion of the Roman Empire in about uh, 313 AD um, and with the conversion of the Emperor Constantine uh, Christians could gather and agree what it was that the Bible taught them and what they believed often in response to things that were being taught which were wrong or heresy and the Chalcedonian Creed uh, originates from one of these ecumenical councils these times when the, uh, the whole Christian world of the time got together and made a decision about what they believed. It wasn't that they were making up what they believed when they went along, it was they were recognised what Christians had always believed, but had just become clearer in the light of things that were being taught which were not true. The Chalcedonian Creed really expresses what Christians believe about Jesus, being both fully the Son of God and fully human, fully God and fully man and expresses what we believe in terms of two natures, Jesus' divine nature and Jesus' human nature, and expresses that they're not mingled or confused, because if that were to happen, then Jesus wouldn't be fully God anymore, or he wouldn't be fully man anymore. And yet, both the, the, the human nature of Jesus and the divine nature of Jesus uh, meet in one person, it's not like he's two separate beings, but he's one person. Why, does, why is this important? Well, it's important because without Jesus being fully both in one person, he could not save human beings by what he did as one person in his divine nature. Uh, we'll learn more about this in our sermons uh, as we uh, approach Christmas, uh, but I hope that it helps us to understand what it means to believe that Jesus is fully God and fully man. Well, here we go, the Chalcedonian Creed. We then, following the Holy Fathers, all with one consent, teach men to confess one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood truly God and truly man, of a reasonable soul and body, consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood, in all things like unto us without sin, begotten before all ages of the Father according to the Godhead and in these latter days for us and for our salvation, born of the Virgin Mary, the Mother of God, according to the manhood, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, to be acknowledged in two natures, unconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, 
inseparably, the distinction of natures being by no means taken away by the union, but rather the property of each nature being preserved and concurring in one person and one subsistence, not parted or divided into two persons, but one and the same Son, and only begotten, God the Word, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the prophets from the beginning have declared concerning him, and the Lord Jesus Christ himself has taught us, and the creed of the Holy Fathers has handed down to us. Amen. The Apostle Paul reminds us of our natural position before the Almighty God in his letter to the Romans, writing, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our basic human instinct is to make ourselves the king of our own kingdoms, so dethroning Jesus as the Lord and creator of all, and ignoring his perfect law in the Bible. It doesn't take long to think of the ways in which we've done this during the last week, forgetting or ignoring that all things were made through him. So I invite us all just to spend a moment recalling these things in silent personal reflection and bringing them before God, who forgives those who humbly ask for forgiveness in the name of Jesus. Let's say this confession prayer together now and then carry on in a time of prayer. Most merciful Father, our creator and judge, we acknowledge and confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed. We have not loved you with all our heart and we have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We earnestly repent and are truly sorry for all our sins. For your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us and strengthen us to serve and obey you in lives wholly renewed by your Spirit. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. So our prayers today are going to follow a slightly different pattern. I'm going to give you some time to consider things you'd like to pray for and then give you some time to pray for them wherever you are watching today. Now, given the theme of our service, it seems fitting to begin by giving thanks to God for his generosity in the everyday things of life that we tend to probably almost not even notice. Um, you may be watching this um, in peace and quiet on your own or it could be that you've got some noisy little ones um, and whatever situation you're in um, on your own or as a group we, hopefully you can all join in this together um, so let's just start by looking around the room that you're in um, and just have a look at all that you own and just remind yourself that these are all gifts from God think about the last 24 hours or the morning that you've just had and some of the moments that you've enjoyed perhaps the sun streaming through the window or a warm shower or a cup of coffee and just take some time now to think on your own or to chat with those that you're with about things that you would particularly like to say thank you to our, our generous uh, Heavenly Father. I suggest you pause the video um, and then when you're ready um, pray on your own or together uh, giving thanks and then when you start the video again I'll continue our prayers. Father we want to thank you for your kindness to us. You have promised that you will never leave us or forsake us and you have reminded us that you are our good heavenly father who delights to good give good gifts to your children and we're sorry that we take all your generosity for granted on a day by day basis. Please teach us habits of gratitude by the work of your Holy Spirit within us. Amen. I'm now going to lead us in prayer for our nation. 
and our town and our church family as we approach Christmas. Father, as we see our news feeds, we're aware of so many pressing needs that we face as a country. Please give wisdom to those in government as they make many huge decisions regarding the future of our country. Please equip those who we read about who are campaigning for justice in our country, for those who speak for the oppressed in our land. Give them boldness and clarity and help us as Christians to, to speak with grace and truth, not fearing those who can only harm the body, but fearing you, our creator and judge. And Father, we thank you too for the opportunity Christmas gives us to reflect and to celebrate your son, our Lord Jesus, who gave up his rights, making himself nothing, becoming a vulnerable baby. And so we're very grateful to you that you have provided a way for us to know you. Because if we know the Lord Jesus, then we know you, our Father God. And as we come out of lockdown and adjust to tier two regulations, as we approach Christmas with a long list of things to get done, please help us as a church family to keep pointing each other to you. Help us to serve one another. Help us to make the most of the opportunities that we have through our Facebook page and through our online services. And we pray especially for John as he commits time to studying your word, to preparing those talks. Father, give him clarity, give him boldness and help him to communicate the wonderful truths that we know from your word, those truths that, that set us free and set other people free. Father, we thank you for our relationship with you. We thank you that we can pour out our hearts to you and bring our requests to you. Amen.
As we come to the end of our service this morning, I'd like to let you know of a couple of resources we've created specifically for children and families. On our website, you can find the link to two videos. The first is a short story of the Nativity, and the other um, is about Chris Stingles. We really hope you enjoy them and they help you get in the Christmas spirit as we keep thinking about why we celebrate Christmas. Also, over the next few weeks, we'll be telling you a bit more about how you can get involved with our other Christmas events and activities. Christmas certainly isn't cancelled. We're going to finish our service today by singing again. Um, but just before we do, may I encourage you to drop us an email to request an invite to our Zoom coffee and chat after the service, if you'd like to join us for that. The email address will be coming up just after the song when we finish singing. But whether you can make it to the Zoom or not, we look forward to having you with us again, watching next week's service. Take care. home.